If you have a copy of God's Word this morning, open it to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. And we'll begin reading in verse 10. We're getting close to the end, but it's not this day. <laughs> Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, No. Then Haggai said, If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, It does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, considered, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and ask that you would bless our time in your word as you've uh, blessed our time of singing praises to you and about you. Um, what a sweet time it is to lift our voices and sing to praise you through song and through lyric that is designed to draw our attention to the beautiful and magnificent character of our God and the wonderful, magnificent salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, now we ask that you would take us deep in your word and that you would use your word to lift our worship high and that we would pursue you, Lord, and know and be reminded that you are the greatest treasure that anyone could ever seek. And you've given yourself to all through Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless our time now in Christ's name. Amen. So verse 14, I want to read verse 14 and kind of give a little bit of a recap of, of last week. Um, if, if you're new here or if you haven't been here for the whole series, I, you can go to our website and, and catch up if you'd like. Um, there's one sermon in particular where we read where God says, I, I, I got rid of the, the harvest, right? And, and that's a blessing. Um, it's, it's a blessing when God removes the things that we're pursuing over him, right? And God is drawing our attention back to himself by removing things that we've placed higher than him in our life. And so that is a blessing. And, and that was back in chapter 1 that we discussed that. But here in verse 14 of chapter 2, Haggai answered after the priests responded correctly that no, nothing holy or set apart for sacrifice can touch something and make it holy, but something unclean can make what it touches unclean and does. And so Haggai answers and says, so is it with this people. So this is, this is God's comment to them of their labors, of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Clean. This is, this is God's verdict on the people after showing them what the law says about clean and unclean things, as I said. And, and here's the verdict, and you'll remember this from last week if you were here. Here's the verdict that God gives the people. Appeasement is not worship. 
Appeasement is not worship. Going through the motions is merely appeasement. It's not worship. And we talked about how often we get drawn into appeasement in our everyday life, and they are going through the motions of trying to please or appease God in order to have the harvest be plentiful again, to go back to a life of abundance and comfort. And so they're just going through the motion. They're laying their hands to the work, but their heart is not in it, and God's calling them on this. Anytime we go through the motions and we seek to appease and not worship, it is based on some skewed view of works or the purpose of works and a works salvation. We talked about that last week. Going through the motions is appeasement, and that's what they're guilty of. Having joy towards God in our motions is worship. There's a difference. Going through the motions is appeasement. Having joy in our motions towards God is worship. And evidently from the passage, they're not having that. And so God called them on a point that Jesus, if you'll recall from the Gospels, reminds the people of his day when he says in Matthew 15, 7 through the first part of 9, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah and also Haggai, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. God's saying the same thing here in Haggai to the people of Haggai's day. Isaiah said it. All the prophets have said it. Jesus said it when he came. Because our natural tendency, this is not a problem that is specific and isolated to Israel. It's a problem that is specific to fallen mankind. We would rather have God obligated to us than us obligated to him. And so if we can somehow appease him, we think that we can make him obligated to us to give us what we want. And so Jesus said the same thing as Haggai is saying here and Isaiah Going through the motions is appeasement, not worship. And God is making a point, as if you'll remember um, in last week's passage, for the purpose of clarifying the purpose, the true purpose of the law, and the true purpose of works. The purpose of the law is to drive us to the mercy and saving grace of God. It is to lay a righteous standard before us so that we can see that we cannot keep it and therefore we need someone else to keep it for us. Amen? And that person is Jesus Christ who was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. And so the purpose of the law is to lay God's righteous standard for us before us to point out that we cannot keep it and, and not only can we not, but we have not kept it and that we need mercy. We need grace. We need justice to be satisfied on our behalf, right? You get pulled over and you, you get a speeding ticket and boy, don't you wish that somebody could step in and take that punishment for you. We, we need that in an in in infinitely greater way in Jesus Christ. The, the purpose of the law is not to create a bunch of legalists. That's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of works is expressing gratitude to God for his mercy and saving grace. That's the purpose of works. And God's, God's reminding them of this once again that your works are not somehow making you clean before me. Everything, because of your un uncleanliness, your impurity, everything you touch is defiled unless you become wholly pure. And we talked about that last week. The law cannot save. The law cannot save. It does not have the power to save, Paul tells us in Romans. It can only declare your standing. It's very important for us to understand that. It, it does not have the power to save. The law has no power to enable you to keep the law. 
It just declares what the law is and it declares what your standing is on the law. So God has used his law here to point out the absolute inability of man to earn a good standing before God on their own. And it's not a message that in our flesh we like to hear. It's offensive to the natural man, the Bible tells us. And now God is here, as we've just read in verse 15 through 19, God is stirring the people by recalling their past. He's stirring the people by recalling their past. And I want to pull, I, I want to pull all of this together um, and, and show you the absolute long-suffering mercy and grace of God towards sinners. Because that's what we see here. At this moment, God is saying, recall your life when you were neglecting me. That's what he's saying here. I'm, it's a para can't paraphrase. Recall your life, how it was when you were neglecting me, when you were going about your life with no regard for me, with no regard for my presence, with no regard for worshiping me. Recall your life when you were neglecting me or recall your life when I wasn't at the center of your life or recall your life when I wasn't your ultimate treasure. I wasn't the ultimate treasure that you saw after in your life. In verse 15 through 17, now then consider from this day onward before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord. How did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hell. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. God is putting before their minds again what their life was like before he confronted them about their apathy back in the beginning of chapter 1. And really, their neglect of any worship of God at all. God is reminding of this, uh, them of his rebuke and their seasons of lack. God is reminding them of their seasons of lack. And here's the thing. And, and, and this, is, this is something that I don't think we get well enough Although they went through seasons of lack, and I'm sure that everyone, every adult in this room has been through seasons of lack, even when we go through seasons of lack, and even when they went through seasons of lack, it was still by the mercy of God's providing and sustaining hand that they had anything at all. You see, we, we, we tend to have gratefulness when we're abounding, right? Right? And, and we don't tend to have gratefulness when we're, when we're not abounding. As if somehow it's not God's hand that's providing us even when we're lack. And, and this is a, a crucial truth to remember as fallen humanity. We seem to think that what we have, we have because of who we are. And what we do. And what we know. And our capabilities. And if there's any reason that we don't have more, then it must be due to a reason outside of ourselves. Now, I mean, I know that, that we may not admit this to one another, but I'm telling you, this is at the core of our sinful hearts. We want glory. We want glory. Our natural tendency is to want glory. And so we give the credit when there's credit to be given to ourselves, when it's good credit. And when it's bad credit, we want to give the credit to someone outside of ourselves or something outside of ourselves. This is the natural train of lots, thought. So we never lay the blame of, of lack on us. And generally speaking, we never want to lay the blame for lack on us. And, and you see that here in the people of Haggai. I mean, it took, they didn't have, right? They went thinking they had 50 measures and they only had 20 they thought they had 10 they had less right and and they weren't calling out for god to confront them god had to come down through the prophet and confront them with their with their negligence and we're the same way 
We are the same way. We, we never give the credit for what we have on God. That's our natural tendency. We only want to give the credit for the lack, for what we don't have, right? Well, God just must not be pleased with me. God must be mad at me. God, this is God's fault. Why would God do this to me? We only want to give God credit when there's a lack. That's our natural tendency. And here in Haggai, not only is God saying that he has caused the lack because of their lack of proper priorities, but by implication, God is also saying the only reason they had any at all is because he is great in mercy and grace. No person, and this, this is important for us to, to understand, no person in this life will ever know nor experience life without the merciful provision of God. No one. There has never been a human being alive. There has never been a human being in the history of mankind that has not experienced the merciful, gracious provision of God. No matter their circumstances, they have experienced the mercy of and grace of God. And Job understood that truth, did he not? Job under, understood that truth when he said, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Right after experiencing great loss, after being in great abundance, He understood that even though he was right now in the moment of lack, everything he had before that was from God's hand. And everything he has now was in God's hand. All provision, whether it is light or abounding, we are sustained by the hand of God. And to get that point across while pointing out that it is God that deserves the credit, and preeminence in our lives, God has confronted them with their negligence. That's what he's doing. He's confronting them with their negligence. Getting across the point that I'm the one that kept you from having more, but I'm also the one that gave you what you had. I'm your provider. I am your sustainer. He holds the universe in his hands, right? He's reminded them of covenant curses for disobedience. He's reminded them of their lack of material things due to their negligence and disobedience. And then God says something here that is just mind-boggling to me. And I believe to you. It's so counter to what he previously says that it just stops you in your tracks. Right? He says... What, what, what was going on in your life, right? You went thinking you had 50 measures and you only had 20. Everything that you were doing, there was a lack because of your negligence, because of your lack of desire for me, because of your lack of worship. Even now, your heart's not in it. And he says, after I've done all of this, he says, you still did not return to me. And then he says, Is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. And, and here's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting him to say, But from now on, you're on your own. But from now on, I'm out. But from now on, I'm going to call down a little fire from heaven, right? That's what the disciples thought. Hey, Jesus, these people, you know, they're not, they're not appreciating you. Should we call down fire from heaven? I mean, I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, there are many times if we were God, there would be less people on this planet. Amen? If we're honest... There would be less people on this planet. And you read this 
from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to here, and you think God's going to say, enough. You want to know what, what uh, uh, no having nothing is? But he doesn't say that. He says something so antithetical to that, so contrary to that, that it's mind-boggling. But from this day on, I will bless you. It's not in us to be that way. Not naturally. God blesses his image bearers in spite of our behavior. It's, it's breathtaking. It's astounding. It's convicting. It's comforting. I mean, what a list to read in verse 10 through 19, right? I mean, God is stressing these truths to them. Everything you touch is unclean because of your impurity. Everything you touch is clean because you're sinners. Everything you touch is unclean. You neglected me. Here, another truth, you neglected me. All, all these things that I've done to draw your attention, to, to try to grab your attention, and yet you still didn't return to me. Even, even as you're building the temple right now, it's not worship. You're going through the motions. It's appeasement. Yet with all this attention that God bestowed upon you, you still did not turn back to God. And then to conclude all of that with, but from this day on, I will bless you, is just amazing. It's amazing grace. What an astonishing close to a speech. As I said, the antithesis of what you would expect to be said, if, if we're being honest. If it, was, if it was my letter to someone, I don't know that it would have ended that way, Just if we're honest with ourselves. I would expect, I'm done, you're on your own, I'm out of here, plagues are coming. What is not expected is but from this day on I will bless you. Now, here, here's what I want to pull it all together and say. Why is God recalling all of this, all of these things that they've been doing, all of their sinful behavior, all their negligence, all their appease, appeasing works, or hoped to be appeasing works? Why is he doing this and yet going to bless them nonetheless? Right, and, and I don't claim this to be exhaustive for who can exhaust the purposes of God but God. But here's what I believe is going on based on Scripture. And it's this. God uses varying means to draw our attention to him. God uses a variety of means to draw our attention to him. And we see replete examples of this in the Bible as well as real life. But in particular, we see this exemplified in the book of Haggai that we're studying here. He uses varying means to draw our attention to him. In chapter 1, God rebukes the people by confronting their sin. So there's rebuke. In chapter 2, 1 through 9, God comforts them with the knowledge of his presence and character. Right? Right? I'm still in your midst. I'm still here. Fear not, according to the covenant that I made with you in Egypt, because I am a faithful God, and I do not change, and I keep my promises always, no matter what happens, no matter the circumstances. I keep my promises. My promises being kept aren't based on your behavior. They're based on my character. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed, Malachi tells us. 
And as we said, this, this beautiful tr truth in chapter 2, 1 through 9, that God always keeps his promises in spite of us. Praise the Lord. In chapter 2, 10 through 14, God rebukes the people by confronting the people of their abuse of the law and works, and he shows them the utter sinfulness and depravity of their own hearts and their own, their absolute inability for us to make ourselves righteous. We cannot make ourselves righteous. We need an alien righteousness. And I don't mean UFO alien. I mean a, a righteousness outside of ourselves, a righteousness from someone other than us. Myself, Kent, needs a righteousness outside of himself because I have none to offer God. So he rebukes, he confronts, he, he makes them aware of their sinfulness, he makes them aware of their inability to make themselves right before him, he confronts their, their sinful expressions, and then he confronts their sinful hearts. He lets them know that he is the one that still sustains them. And then in chapter 2, 15 through 19, God lists their sin and the due results of sin, but at the same time comforts the people with undeserved blessings. You see the, the varying means that God's using here. He's, he's using withdrawing, right? Withdrawing from them what they, what they want in order for them to see what they truly need, which is him. They're pursuing the temporal things of life over him, and they're caring more about the temporal things of life than him. And so he removes the abundance of temporal things so that they realize that what they really need is the eternal one rather than the temporal things. Man shall not live by bread alone, Jesus said, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So God withdraws abundance from them so that they'll be in need and hopefully turn back to him, but they don't. So then he confronts them and makes them aware of their sinful behavior and their neglect of him. And that doesn't work either. And then he, he makes them aware of that, you know, you cannot make yourself right before me. Just because you put your hand to the, the work of God doesn't make you reconciled to God. Works do not justify. Works cannot declare you blameless. The law cannot make you a law keeper. He even tells them, I'll be in your midst. Fear not. Work. That doesn't work. Now they're just going through the motions. And he lists this all out. And as I said, you would expect, I'm out. I've had enough of you people. But he says, I'll bless you. And I think that he is, what we see here in the book of Haggai is the varying means of God, the, the variety of ways that God uses uh, temporal things and common things in our lives to draw our attention to him. He explores the depths of means in order to our grip our attention to him. It's astounding. It's astounding. So not, now God is saying, you know what? I, I used a lack of. I used confrontation. I used really the gospel that you can't make yourself right before me. You need to be pure, and you're not, so you need me to make you pure. Now he says, I've used all those things, and now I'm going to use abundance. Because I use a variety of ways, and I'm long-suffering to my people, and I'm, I forbear with them because I love them and want them to look to me. Why? Why does God go to such lengths towards sinful man? Because here's why. Because God is gracious beyond measure. 
His mercy is new every morning and endures forever. And his grace is beyond measure. It is immeasurable. God here shows these expressions of grace here in the book of Haggai. He's long-suffering towards sinful people. He's gracious in not leaving them to themselves. He's creative in his approach to them, using multifaceted ways to address personalities and emotions and physical needs. He is persistent in his pursuit of his image bearers. He gives common grace to all mankind, no matter it rains and the sun shines on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. The list of examples are endless in our life, and you can probably recall many different ways in which God used common things to grip your attention to him. God sometimes gives us over to the calamity to which we so long for. You ever had that happen in your life? You don't have to raise your hand. God gives us over to the calamity that we desire. We're going down a sinful path, and God says, he tries to, he's, he's trying to get our attention, trying to get our attention. He says, you know what? Okay, you're going to really see what this, this is not for your good. This is for your detriment. I'm going to let you taste a little bit of detriment, and then I'll pull you back. Sometimes God gives us an abundance of temporal needs so that we might acknowledge that it has come from his hand and thank him. And that's, that's what I think is going on here in Haggai. God says, you've had a lack. I've confronted you. Now I'm going to be even more gracious, and I'm going I'm to pour out abundance on you. And we'll see if that turns your heart to be thankful to me or if all that stuff will just become another idol in your life. Sometimes God puts us in the path of his word so that we might hear the truth of our own sinfulness, right? God has been gracious. If you're a Christian, God has been gracious to put you in a path maybe that you had no idea. He put you in a path with someone that was either going to speak to you or preach to you the word of God so that the word of God confronts you. He does that to the people here in Haggai. Sometimes God allows us to ponder our sinfulness through the tragic consequences of our sinful choices. Sometimes we are so hard-hearted that God allows us to go into that calamity so that we can suffer the consequences of that calamity and come to the end of our self and see that that idol that we were chasing cannot satisfy and only God can. And, and a lot of times, those tragic consequences that come into our life, God allows us to, to see that, taste that, experience that, so that it will soften our heart to the gospel. Now, let me, let me insert this, and I, 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 just, I just thought about this and want to say it. That, that doesn't mean that when tragedy strikes that there's sinfulness going on. Hey, Jesus, why is this man blind? Is it his sin or his parents? Neither. He's blind so that at this moment I could heal him and glory would be to God. So I want to make sure I say that. We don't want a bunch of Job's friends, right? That's not good. Sometimes God allows us to feel isolated in this life. I mean, to feel utterly alone, maybe even betrayed by the people around us so that we will finally seek refuge in him alone. Because here's the deal. If you're looking for satisfaction and ultimate joy in a person, you will be let down every single time. And you're putting a weight on that relationship that it cannot bear. There is no other Messiah in your life other than Jesus Christ. There's no other Savior in your life other than Jesus Christ. And if you are putting on any relationship whether it be your children, your spouse, your siblings, your friends, whatever it is, if you're putting on that relationship, you need to make me filled with joy. You need to not let me down. You need to have immutable character. You need to make me feel great. If you're putting that kind of weight on a relationship that's human, they will always let you down. That relationship will all, always let you down, and you will bring harm to that relationship every time. Because you're asking that relationship to do what only Christ can do for you. 
And so sometimes God lets us even feel betrayed by friends or family and feel utterly alone so that we'll realize, man, I keep chasing these things, hoping that they'll satisfy, and they don't. And then you'll look to the one, the only one that can satisfy, and it's Jesus. And because of sin, all of these mercies and gracious acts of kindness by God, they may seem subtle. I think that to, to the natural flesh, they're, they're extremely subtle because of sin. All these mercies and all these gracious acts of kindness by God in our everyday life to try to grip us and point us to him, they seem subtle, but in reality and based upon the nature and character of the holy God, these acts are utterly earth-shaking and breathtaking. I mean, we're, we're, we're like an ant is to us, to God. I mean, more so. You can't even describe the difference. A holy God that could speak and create a universe and bring things into existence that never existed could also speak and it's all gone. And yet he has long suffering towards his image bearers in their sinful behavior and neglect of him who always seek to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And yet he still forbears with us. And yet he still blesses us and gives us the sustenance we need to survive. And he comes after us and he seeks to draw our attention to him through the many, the multifaceted ways that he has and that he can use to get our attention. And yet, we still don't return to the Lord, he says. And yet he says, but from now on I will bless you. These, these are not subtle. These are breathtaking. For a holy God to forbear with sinful man is breathtaking. These acts are, as Romans 2, 4 says, don't, don't make this mistake. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? That's what God's doing here in the book of Haggai. He's withholding, he's confronting, he's giving them the gospel. And now he's going to bless. And he's doing all of these things as acts of kindness in the hopes that it will lead them to repentance. I think we're going to get to heaven and it's just going to be an unbelievable list of the multifaceted ways that God intervened in your life to draw you to himself and lead you to repentance. And I pray that you have repented. God does all these things and more so that we may break out in praise of God like the Apostle Paul in Romans 11, 33 through 36, which says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Don't miss, don't miss the promise, as I said last week. And, and listen, don't miss the breathtaking ways that a holy God moves in your life to draw you and your attention to him in order to lead you to repentance. Repent of your sins and call upon the Lord, of the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, we are so thankful at the creativity in which you and the lengths in which you go to lead rebels 
who spend their life seeking to suppress the truth of you. You're, you're creative and you go to such lengths all of our lives to draw our attention to you and your worthiness of our every second worship and our every breath. And you're so long-suffering, Lord, because we can be so hard-hearted and we can be so hard-headed and we can be blind to not subtle, but the earth-shattering ways in which you chase after us. And you do so in kindness so that it would lead us to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ who fills the void of our unrighteousness with his righteousness and pays for with his blood our unrighteousness and makes us holy, pure before you. And it is only through Jesus that we can have this purity and this righteousness and this atonement. And so we thank you for Christ and our Savior. And we thank you for salvation. And we thank you for finding us with the gospel of Jesus Christ and using means um, in our life to, to grip our attention to you, Lord. And even as Christians, we are so easily... Um, our attention is so easily drawn away from you and to temporal things. And Lord, I pray that you will forgive me and forgive us and that you will grip our attention once again to the surpassing satisfaction that is found in Jesus Christ. That he is the treasure that's worth giving everything up for. We pray that you would be glorified in our hearts and in our lives. We pray that you've been glorified here today, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.